Okay, welcome back. This is the second part of 18th century number one. And now that you've had a chance to have a, something to drink or something to eat, here's the second part. Here's the second part of class. I'm going to do two more pieces of art, so it shouldn't be too much longer. Well, two two more plus a few around them. Um, first, I want to show. I'm going to stop here at um, at, at this piece. Arrow. Um, I went too far. Okay, uh, and I I want to show you uh, the style of art that was popular in, this, in the uh, 18th century with the French Academy. Um, this was called Elegant Outdoor Entertainment. And this piece, uh, th that was the category. Um, it, this is a style that is known as Rococo. Um, it was very, very popular uh, among the, um, amongst the very wealthy, the, the super rich, the royalty, uh, and those folks. So even though I told you there were changes in patronages, pat patronage, that was true. Uh, there were more people buying art. The wealthy were still buying art. Um, Jean-Antoine Antoine Watteau was one of the favorites of, um, of the super elite. And and uh, it, it was work like this that made him so famous. Um, this is called The Pilgrimage to the Island of Cythera. This one is not an AP piece, but um, um, he was one of the leading uh, artists of the Rococo period. And you can see that it was all about um, beauty and grace and elegance. You can see that the colors were somewhat pastel. Everybody was um, gorgeous and, and looked loving and happy. Uh, everything was just so, so, so very beautiful, so very elegant. Um, the island of Cythera was a mythical um, island devoted to, uh, to love. You can actually see in the painting, there is a, 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 a ruin, a statue of Venus, the goddess of love. And you can see that the, the royal, the, um, uh, all these aristocrats are all broken off into couples. And you can see the water, they probably just arrived to this island and they're all being attended by all these pooties. So it's all, it, it's all very, um, very elegant and, you know, very, um, uh, well, I don't want to say frivolous, but, you know, it, it was about being rich and carefree and, and uh, being concerned about those kinds of things. So let's, and, and the piece that's on the AP that you guys already know is also this way. Here's another piece by Watteau um, called the Signboard of Gersant, and it's about, um, it's about buying art. It's about being cultured. And you can see this, um, this couple is uh, there um, not only looking at art to decorate their beautiful home, um, but also there to be seen in this intellectual pursuit. I'm going to show you another piece that show these great art markets. All right, another um, very famous uh, painter of the, um, of the, uh, Rococo style was um, uh, Francois Boucher. And as you can see, this very uh, lovely frivolous piece um, was meant for, uh, for male entertainment. Um, this is another of his. This is the, called the Triumph, Triumph of Venus. Um, and again, it was all um, very frivolous, very beautiful, very frothy. Uh, didn't have a lot of, uh, didn't have a lot of content uh, aside from um, beauty. Another one by uh, Fragonard. And then our main person we're going to look at is Jean Honoré Fragonard. This one is called The Meeting, but it was one of a series of several paintings that he made. Um, but I'm going to show you the one you know, which is The Swing. And of course, you know The Swing because it was a work of art that was uh, that was um, the subject of the inspiration by a 20th century ar ar um, artist, Yinka Shonavare. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna look at the swing. Let's take a quick peek at the meeting first. Um, as you can see, we have a, an elegant, young, aristocratic couple who are meeting in kind of a forgotten um, garden. Uh, and you can see that it must be an un, um, you know, it must be a tryst that, that is not, people are not approved of because they both look like they're, they just were alarmed by some sound that they heard and they're looking in, in, in that direction anxiously. Um, and they're trying to, you know, hide away from, um, you know, hide, hide away from other, from prying eyes so that they can meet in, in uh, private. Uh, meanwhile, this, um, 
kind of garden which has gone without being tended it's kind of a hidden garden is uh, has a, a statue of venus and 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 uh, and and her uh, son uh who is yeah overseeing the whole thing so not you know all, all symbolic but with the gods looking down on this on this tryst uh adoringly all right let's take a look at um at, at fragonard's the swing and oh, there we go and i know you guys are pretty well aware of it it's actually really lovely not to have to show it to you on the screen in our classroom because it, it's dark and it doesn't show up on the screen very well so it's good to see it um, all, in all its detail on the computer um, so fragonard was a student of boucher uh, this guy so he was his student um, and he was a he was a very uh, he he was very he found early success working for the rich noble um, patron uh, people in the court. Um, it was his misfortune, unfortunately, though. Whoops, to <laughs> sorry. It was his misfortune to live um, in the in the time of the French Revolution, and um, and he uh, all of his his patrons were either destroyed either physically or financially by by the revolution. Um, and he was unable to make that shift from um, in style from the frivolous Rococo style to the more serious neoclassical style that followed um, in this same century. And so this style was very short lived because the um, French Revolution took care of that. Um, and, and he disappeared at the end of his career in obscurity, which is kind of sad because he's really quite a, um, you know, quite a lovely painter. Um, here, let me get us back over to the swing. Um, so uh, hopefully one of the things you notice about this painting is um, the beauty with which it's painted. Um, he paints very loosely. Uh, he uses a lot of texture. He uses quite a lot of color. Um, he, he is a lovely painter. Uh, and um, you can see that, uh, that he is, he's, it, even though it, he uses a lot of loose brushwork, it, it reads very clearly as a unified whole. And he, in the style of Rococo, he painted um, his color. His color palette was extremely um, pastel. Um, pastel colors were preferred. They were light. They were beautiful. They were, you know, they were. Uh, it, it had that kind of um, light-hearted look to them, to it. And as we've mentioned before, we've looked at this painting before. It's set again in a hidden, a hidden garden, and um, and you can see that the young woman is so happy to be kind of showing off on her swing. She's got her servant in the back, you know, pushing, pulling her with a rope, um, and her gentleman friend admiring her up her skirt, um, which she seems all very happily aware of uh, in in the foreground. And, and again, again, they're over, they're um, wa watched over by um, by Pudi, who are overlooking them. And she looks she looks adoringly down at the at the young gentleman. Um, it's a, it's a it's an exercise in sheer pleasure. And he was influenced um, um, by I think Baroque artists. I want you to think a little bit about which Baroque artists um, might have influenced him. And maybe her, his, his uh, women aren't quite as robust, but uh, I, if you thought Rubens, I think you would be quite right. Um, lots of loose brushwork, um, beautiful, beautiful landscape. Um, and of course, the angel is, is looking over them approvingly and, and actually holding his, his finger up to his mouth as to say, Shh, I'll keep your secret for you. Um, so... Uh, and and the uh, the other thing, uh, one is keeping their secrets, and the other is sitting on um, a bee's nest, um, which might have something to do with um, with the sting of a lost love. So um, the patron for this work um, was the mistress of Louis the Louis the fifteenth. Um, and so she was the she was the person who commissioned all of these. It wasn't his wife; it was his mistress. Fourteen paintings, so I guess he kept her pretty well. Um, they were all of lovers set in these luxurious set settings, and most of them were these kind of this kind of secret tryst. Um, and the and interestingly, though, however, um, 
um, she commissioned them and he painted them and she rejected some of these works and and she rejected it because the, she felt that the style was passe um, which is which is also kind of interesting okay so i'm gonna go on and here's another close-up of uh of our girl on the swing. And I want to remind you of Yinka Shonabari's work, his response. And another close up of his. All right, here's your questions. So, what are the elements of this painting that fit the Rokogo style? Who are the patrons? I already, I already ta talked about that. But why, why would they want to be painted? Why would they want to look, you know, what was their life like that they wanted paintings like this? And the more important question might be was, is how does Yinka Shonabari update this image and twist the meaning? Now, you my guys might remember, you might have to go back to your notes to look up uh, Shonabari, but I want you to think about why did he choose this? This was, this was an art that was commissioned by, um, by uh, super elite people. And, and Shonabari was not that, you know, Shonabari was an immigrant uh, to England, but yet, that's what he wanted. He wanted to use that, that as, as the piece that, that was his inspiration. It's kind of interesting. Okay, so now let's go on to our last piece. And oh, so I'm giving you a tour past some other things that are on the, um, in, the, in the slideshow. These are all paintings that were done as part of the grand tour, the tour that um, these young adults uh, would go on. To, uh, they would go to uh, Italy and to Greece um, and to finish off their education. And while they were on tour, one of the great things to do was to collect art. And this is one of those big art galleries that made <laughs> "Quote unquote masterpieces for for these um, young tourists to collect, uh, and so there were a lot of a lot of pieces like this. And uh, the Canalettos, uh, this is Venice, obviously. These were he was very famous, so they called it um, uh, they call it a scene painting of these a view painting. They were views of of Italy." that people would take home with them to remind them of their their year abroad all right and now we're moving in towards uh neoclassicism but here's where i'm going to stop for a minute and this is the next um the next piece that we're going to talk about um this painting is uh called a, a philosopher giving a lecture on the orrery and the painter is joseph wright of derby um, and this is a large painting oil. This is a large um, oil painting. And this is the one that's on the AP. I'm pretty sure it's not the other one. So this is so interesting, right? You can see the style is very different from, from what, what we were just looking at. Total opposite. This painting was done in the later part of the 1700s. So around 1760s, 1770s, right in there. And um, you can see that we've gone back, instead of the light pastel colors and the very loose brushstrokes, we're going back into kind of a neoclassical hiding of the brushwork. Oh, but um, uh, Wright uses uh, tenebrism for that to create great drama in the, in the uh, painting, which is so, so interesting. And, and the tenebrism though, isn't done in the service of God's greatness. It's done for a different reason. And I'm, I'll ask you about that in a minute. All right, so here we have um, two older gentlemen that look like, uh, you know, look like they're scientific, especially this guy seems to be wearing lecturer's robes. And you can see that he has a rapt audience um, and they're all around this device and they're looking into it and the, and the light is coming out from the device. Now I'm gonna show you a picture of, of an orrery. Here's a picture of the device. This is an orrery. This is what uh, an 18th century device that was meant to help um, people of that time understand uh, our solar system. And so the orrery shows the sun, it shows the earth, and it shows the other planets in the solar system and how they circle each other. So it, it kind of tries to show uh, the different, the path of, um, of orbit. Of the, of the planets in the solar system, which is, which is really kind of interesting. So as you can see, it's a scientific tool to understand, understand space around us, understand uh, the planets. 
And here we have it painted in, in really quite a romantic way um, using, using great um, uh, tenebrism. Um, and so what do you think, what do you think that the, what do you think he's trying to do? What's the message? So what does right of Derby think is important? Obviously God is not in this picture, right? There's no God here. It's all science. And so what's light? What's, what's shedding the light? And what's the light of metaphor for? So this is what I want you to answer in, in your, um, in your uh, uh, voice thread. How, how has Joseph Wright of Derby taken the tenebrism that we saw in the Baroque time done in the service of God and the service of the light of the spirit? What is he, how has he taken that and applied it to this theme? And what is this thing? And how is this really a sign of the times? People don't, aren't looking to God for answers anymore, right? What are they looking to? And you can see that the, not, but the painting style is very clear and crisp, but it's also um, very, very dramatic with, um, with tenebrism. Um, let me see if I, yeah, there's a, there would have been a lamp set up inside of the orrery to, to, to shed that light. Um, um, but it's very interesting that, that, you know, he's doing it to great effect. And I also want you to notice that it's not just the older people around the orrery, that it's, he's got this audience of young people who are very influenced by what they're seeing here. So it's a, definitely, it's, a, it's a, like a classroom. I'm going to show you another um, right of, uh, of Derby. And this one is called Experiment um, on a Bird in an Air Pump. And, oops, sorry about that get forward. Um, this one is interesting because um, as you can see, once again, we have a scientific experiment that is, uh, it's got the light source right smack in the middle and he's got the surrounding crowd looking at this, at this experiment. And again, we have, you know, we've got the professor here in the, up, up here demonstrating with this bird in this glass and what has happened is the pump has pulled all the oxygen out of this out of this glass ball causing the, the bird of course to pass out because it doesn't have any oxygen and of course the the kids the, the girls here are shocked and horrified because they're so worried for the bird because the bird is is dropped of what appears to be dead now of course as soon as the scientist lets the air back into the um, into the glass ball, the bird will revive and come back to life. But, um, but you know, for now, uh, he doesn't appear to be. And, and in, he's done it in the exact same style that he did with the orrery, with the light at the, in the middle, um, kind of lighting up, magically lighting up this scientific experiment at night. You can even see a full moon outside. It's very dramatic. Um, and you can see the scientific genius and how he is, how he is educating the, you know, the people, people all around. And I want you to think about how Wright and others like him are, are substituting science for this, uh, you know, in this kind of same dramatic way um, that that possibly we we used to see the church um, do with with their ideas of God and and religion. All right. So answer answer the two questions about. Um, about the, these two on um, VoiceThread, and that's it for the first for the first class.